Hey, it's Matt Pinfield. How are you? It's in a lonely place with Matt Pinfield. <laughs> Name that was because literally myself. I'm here in Hollywood, hanging out in my living room. I love doing this show. It's so much fun for me. And it's also the way I stay in touch with my friends who work in music, people that I love. And we're doing this because of Music Cares. The thing is to raise money for Music Cares, to help out all the musicians that are out of work, everybody that goes from literally the assistants that help book tours to the merch people that are, are, are going to have anything to do for a while to the, you know, literally the guitar techs. I do this with Carrie Brown, Linda Perry, and everybody that's involved with We Are Here. I love doing this show. I was in a lonely place was a song by the Smithereens, and it was also a Humphrey Bogart movie. And I just thought about it because I was literally looking at my gold record of the Smithereens album one day. And I said, wow. The thing that's amazing, though, is I just want to tell you, if you can make a donation, that's fine. If you cannot, we just want to keep you your head in a good place because mental health is so very dangerous in play, at times like these. I mean, it's, you know, we're trying to all stay very positive. And that's what we have to do because our loved ones depend on us. Our loved ones, our friends. And that, you know, for me, that's the most important thing. You have two daughters, <laughs> a mother's elderly man. I just, you know, they mean everything to me. What do you think keeps me sane? It's the music. So the idea of doing the show is just, this is the thing that gets me through. I asked one of my great friends to be on today. You know, he's a, a, a guy I love. We hang out all the time. We, you know, we literally, like, when, when we weren't self-quarantined, seriously, I mean, two or three times a week, we're out. We're going out to eat. We're hanging out with our friends, uh, musicians. He's literally the most, really, he's the most famous and the most, He's the longest celebrated mastering guy doing record mastering I mean, in the industry. How he has mastered everything from Grandmaster Flash and all the early Def Jam hip hop, uh, which is crazy because, you know, like when other people were like, thought hip hop was a uh, passing fade. I was like, no, I'll do it, which is great. Plus all some of the greatest rock records ever. But he's still, I got to be honest with you, I mean, tons of his songs are on the charts. And he also did the Gary Clark Jr. album, which won a ton of Grammys. Yeah, yeah, never not working. And he's one of my favorite people in the world. <laughs> you know, so up in the Bronx, you got Howie, you got the Yankees, and we're both East Coast guys living out here. And it's it's kind of odd that we're not together doing something, but we're doing it here. So I want to introduce you to Howie Weinberg, one of the greatest record mastering guys, <laughs> master of record mastering. Howie, what's up, buddy? Hey, how you doing, man? I'm doing great, man. And guy, for a guy from Jersey, you're pretty cool, you know? <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, it's funny. We love New Jersey, you know. Jersey, as we call it, you know. On the other yeah. side, the bridge and tunnel place. But um, you met your legend, and I, you know, I can't uh, thank you enough for getting me on here, okay? Just we're spreading the message here with Music Cares. It's This is a big deal here. And this is, we're right now, we're... We're, we're, we're guys who can make a difference and we're doing it. And, and I love it, man. I really do. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's amazing. You know, it's funny. I'm, I, I, where you're sitting, I have been in your house, right <laughs> up, you know, it's in, in Laurel Canyon, the legendary Laurel Canyon. I love your place because you go all the way up the, the, the hill. It's this great house. And then you put your mastering studio is literally in your house on the top floor. But I've never, here's the thing. I have a lot of, this is not all my gold platinum records. But I've never seen anyone with more gold platinum records <laughs> than you, and you deserve them because you mastered all of these classics. That's like we're saying, Grancy, I have a gold you have platinum. I got the platinum version of that, by the way. Yeah, but I mean, what I want to, you know, people are really fascinated by you. I remember when you and I were at Chris Cornell, um, like Memorial thing, we were, at, and you finally had Matt Cameron, who, you know, who basically, you know, said, "Oh, Howie," because you worked on all the records. He goes, "You and a guy who loves it loud." Like people <laughs> talk. I thought that was really, really cool. But you know, when you, um, I, I think the thing that really amazes me is you never stop working because you never go out of style because your your talent and mastering is so incredible. Can you tell me about how you started, Howie? Oh, uh, that's a that's a loaded question. You basically, I was looking for a job, and uh, I got a, I got the job as the first messenger of it, Master Disc, which um, my boss was the the great Bob Ludwig, and he took me under his wing. After like eating shit for a year, basically delivering packages all over New York, you know, and I knew all the labels were, and it was great because I could all get freebies and all that stuff. They finally took me out of the mailroom and they 
made me a, a, a copy boy, which in the old days, before there was no digital, uh, they made me uh, making tape copies. And, you know, the, the studio we were at, um, we were making tape copies pretty much for, um, it was considered Mercury Records, Polygram. So any record that was distributed through, it was called Phonogram. Phonogram, Polygram, Rod Stewart, Bee Gees, all of those records. If there was a domestic release, no matter where they mastered it around America, I would get a tape copy of it and duplicate it, you know, make like 10, you know, everything there was real to real tape. So everything went one at a time. So I would, I'd be all night long making tape duplicates. Like I was a tape guy. They, you have to start as a tape guy. And I remember one of my first gigs, they hand me this record. It was just, it was mastered somewhere in the, in the West Coast. They handed me two tapes and you know what it said? Saturday Night Fever. So I was the first guy ever outside of probably the studio to ever hear a Saturday Night Fever. Feeling night fever, you know? Yeah, and, right. Uh, I knew it would be a hit. <laughs> That's very so that was the first record. Well, you well, actually you're you doing duping that at that point. When yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so tell me about when you know you work with Bob Ludwig, legend, you know, like there's so, there's so many, you know, him, Ted Jensen, you like oh, you know, the names that are classics. That are, but you know, so tell me when did you make the transition from being a tape boy to the actual mastering? Well, basically, one of the engineers got fired. And I, I basically, I had no skills. I could barely deliver a package, let alone there. But I knew I had some kind of ear and, and I was special. I couldn't figure out what. So one of the guys in the engineers got fired and they said, okay, here's your, you want his studio? I go, yeah, that's me. I walked in. I didn't know, I didn't know jack shit about anything. I did, you know, and, you know, those days was all, you know, it was all disc cutting and, and it was an older studio, but the, you know, whatever it is. I went in and I faked it for six months. I, I didn't know what I was doing. I was hitting knobs. I had no idea, but you know, I, I got the bug. And it was like, you know, and even in those days, I was like, even though I was making mistakes, I was working really hard and I was fixing them and and I, I got the bug. And it was, it was, it was pretty crazy because in those days everything was tape, vinyl, and that's it. Maybe a cassette tape here and there. And um so I kind of learned the hard way, basically the school of hard knocks, you learn as you go. You know, you know, not like today where you learn and, you know, you go to a fancy school for four or five years. I went and I learned on the job, which is great. Yeah. Which is amazing. So what was the first record that you mastered? What was the first one? Because I know, which one? So I wanted to ask. You gotta laugh at this one, because the second I walked into the studio, there were hits were showing up like, like one after another. and. The first record, I, you know, nobody, you know, okay, they called the studio up and somebody was like, who wants to work on something called rap music? And then the other, older guy goes, I ain't going near that. And I go, yeah, me right here, I got it, you know? So the first <laughs> act, it was called Christmas Rapping by Curtis Blow, okay? And that was a gold, I think it was pretty much, not gold, but one of the biggest, it, I think it was the second or third top, you know, newest uh, rap records. You know, hip hop wasn't even a term then. Uh, put out and and that was managed by uh, and Curtis was managed by Russell Simmons who also went on to uh, uh, we did so well. Well. yes you did all that Def Jam stuff which was cool I love the fact that you I, were I was almost on staff with them other than they didn't pay me you know I mean basically oh. they sent me every project because I was who do you send it I was just the guy and after a while I developed this you know, this swagger of the Def Jam, Rick Rubin, Beastie Boys shit. So, you know, it was pretty cool. I got to admit, and, I, and, I, and just to real reiterate, I lived downtown, right? Exactly where all the records were made. Rick lived down the block. Russell lived there. I, I was like one of the one of the boys, put it that way. But that was, but that was like later on. It blows me away now that you, uh, you, you did those records. <clears throat> one of my favorite records of all time, that I didn't change rap. <laughs> and it was Grandmaster Flash, the message which you worked on. Yeah, I mean, I've looked on your walls. You've got all the curtains below the breaks, all that stuff. But uh, talk to me about working on the message because that is that changed everything. Yeah. Well, yeah. Are you kidding me? That was that was after the I did the breaks and the breaks to that this day was that it was the first first gold twelve inch uh, record. By the way. Yeah. It was a 12 inch record that was gold. I mean, can you imagine that? A 12 inch record selling like almost six, seven hundred thousand records. So then I was basically the guy. 
you know, the, the God, the, you know, the guy in New York, the Sugar guy Hill, in New York. All those guys, Sugar Hill, everybody would go to you. All called me up, all of all, and I, I man, I love this stuff, man. You know, I, I kind of had a kin with you, so, you know, a lot of the brothers, you know, I, I grew up in the Bronx, so it's not like I'm some kid from the, in the Midwest, you know, I, I, I kind of was one of them, you know, we, we, we spoke the same language. And, you know, basically, a lot of those records in the old days, they sounded good, too. They were, they were really well made. And the Flash, I, I loved him. Uh, Joe Sadler was his name. And then... Um, and and Mel, then, Mel, who was so great. Mel, yeah. That record, I got turned on to by Killing Joke, the band. And they played yeah. a show. I was like, they played a show in New Jersey at City Gardens. John Stewart's the bartender. I go upstairs with him after. They got a bottle of Jack Daniels. We're hitting the Jack Daniels. <laughs> drink. We're, all of a sudden, Jazz Coleman and Jordy and the guys from the Killing Joke, who were just like, it's extremely aggressive, cool band, are like, they say to me, you got to hear this. They got a boom box. And they yeah. played me the message. And it, I went, holy shit. And I literally went back to New, Br New Brunswick, New Jersey, and bought that 12-inch the next day. I played it like a thousand times. Because it was, I mean, it was socially conscious music. It was amazing. And it was, oh, yeah, like, it was also, yeah, that record was... Uh, in response to the transit strike, there was a stranger strike that year, and um, basically it was just it it was it was not like a boasting record, you know. Like before that was everything was like you know this and that. Like I got my big gold chain. I got to, this was really a a message, you know. It was like a, a public service announcement in, in a song, you know, and 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 it was delivered like nothing ever, nobody's ever heard before, and and the beats and the rhymes and and the rapping was just. Nothing they can, they haven't even, no, nobody's even touched that yet, you know, to this day. You know, um, in fact, that whole, there were like those four singles in a row. I loved so much by Grandmaster Flash. That, then Message to Survival, then New York, right. New York, Big City of Dreams, whichever it is, and then White Lines. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> I did that White Lines. Don't do it. That, that was a big drug <laughs> pump, you know? That no, was the like one crack, crack was, you know, that was a big, big, big anti drug record, too. Yeah, fantastic message. Yeah. yeah, I love that. I love that. So, so you were doing that stuff for Russell, uh, you know, for Rick Rubin. You were doing all that stuff. Well, then, let me let me make uh, one thing clear. Those guys, Rick was still in high, in when all those those hip hop. Rick was still in college, living in his dorm before Def Jam even started. Russell was managing Curtis Blow, and that was it. And he had a little brother named Joey, Joey Simmons, which we found out was. A run from Run DMC, and um, and basically uh, they they got the bug too, and and um, um, they had, they had somehow gotten together and started a label, and there I was right in the middle of it with the first release, and you know what the first release was, right? Yeah, was it Public Enemy? Was it uh? No, Beastie Boys. Oh, Beastie Boys. Oh, it was <laughs> oh, was it uh, the very first single? Oh, yeah. you the album, License Ill. But it, no, no, right before License Ill, there was a single. You would know what, that. Oh, was it Rock Hard? Or was it? Uh, yeah, so, no, I, I, we got to look this up. But. Now, there, all right, I'll think about it. There's Rock Hard, um, because before we had, it was Cookie Puss, right? No, I think it was Cookie Puss, yeah. possibly. And don't forget, I lived around the corner from, from Yauk, um, Adam Horowitz, and, and, and Mike D. They all lived on the Lower East Side on Christie Street, and I lived not that far away, so... We'd see each other all the time, and, and you know it, it was one happy family, so to speak. Yeah. Good. I love those guys. I miss Yauk every day, man. You know, he was such hey, a. I love Yauk. He was a great guy. Cool he was. Guy. Before he died, man. I mean, I did all those album specials. I mean, you you you, you worked on the records, but for me, I you know they would call me and did do the album specials. And I'll never forget seeing Yauk on the street. Tell him I got a new morning show, man. I saw my house. <laughs> he goes, hey, man, you want me to come up tomorrow? I go, I go, I go. No, I asked him. I go. Hey man, you want, you want to come up and be a guest? He goes, yeah, man. Tomorrow? <laughs> He's like the best. <laughs> he was like, like literally just walking down the street becomes a. I mean, they were the I love it, man. You know. But so tell me about those. So with the beastie, so you were doing twelve inches. So you were the guy who was literally doing all that Craig Def Jam stuff. So you yeah, well, what happened was basically, uh, you know, it, it, it's like anything else. Where you start out, I'm the guy. You know, I, you know, I'm the guy who does what they call. I do the plates. You know, I'm the guy. You know, he's the guy who does the plates, and you know, after a while, like, like anything else, it, you know, um, you know, it's like a domino, one after another after another, and each one of these records, especially all all the Def Jam 
stuff and I did all the Tommy Boy stuff and the profile records and every other one's, you know, the, um, right. Uh, so, label from Philly too. Um, oh, there was they had, uh, oh, I can't oh, oh. we've got to figure this out, but they, uh, they had, they had the, that big club down there, the, uh, the, 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 the um, what was the one? Um, but they, they, um, the, the fever, Saturday, you know, the fever, you know, that yeah, the the big, record, uh, after I remember who was on that. Was that Love, too, Bug, you know? Love Bug Starsky, right? It was like, yeah, yeah well, that's too. Yeah, we got all that. But, uh, you know, this was a long, this is 30 years ago, man. I mean, what, 80, no, almost little. 35 years ago. You know, it's like, <laughs> It, it, you know, I, I take a lot of supplements. I try to remember the shit, but um, there was a, b- a bunch of really cool labels. And and that was even pre-Def Jam. And this was Def Jam really came about because, you know, it, it was it was Rick Rubin's, um, you know, um, basically it, it's his passion to start a label. And he was still, he started the label while he was in his dorm at NYU. And I lived down the block from them. And Rick used to show up at my house all the time because we did some records together beforehand. And I had this big ass loft downtown and I had a big system there and, and, and he would come over and listen to records and I, nobody knew who anybody was. And we were just kind of cool little cats, you know, like he was a neighborhood guy and he seemed pretty cool, you know, whatever, you know? And I, and years <laughs> later, he, uh, he said to me, he goes, you know, you were like the one guy who was really nice to me when nobody else would even give me the time of day. And I went, that's what I do. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And you worked on all those records, which is so great. And you no, know, so all that Def Jam stuff. I mean, I've seen. I mean, you're like I said, right behind you. People can see it. You have more, like I said, more golden platinum records than anybody else. Well, don't forget, they at the time people. This the Def Jam was really the first, like one of the first labels. People would they would buy the name, whatever any product that had the Def Jam recordings on it. You knew it was going to be a dope ass product. You know, it become Public Enemy, Slick Rick. Um, uh, and third base, all of these, you know, they're all, every one of those records, and to this day, LL Cool J, I mean, I mean, it, it, it's, it, it was a phenomenal run that I don't think anybody's ever seen before in yeah, that, that, that genre. Oh, yeah. Not Motown, that's different, yeah. You know, it's, uh, and you did them all, like every, everything from like, you know, uh, you know, I, I, you know, literally rock the bells to, you know, Modest and oh, Knock yeah, yeah. them all. And that's so, fun. that's so great. <laughs> Knock you out is one of my favorite songs. I mean, I just love that. Well, yeah, that was another one. That and, and I worked with uh, James Todd Smith and LL Cool J, you know, and and that, that just Mama when that came out, that really. I mean, he still had some platinum records before that, and he had some pretty big hits. But this one was like, you know, it's that ground, you know, it's that one that pushes you over the edge. That was the groundbreaking, the best album of the year on, on on every charts, you know, hit singles, you know. Uh, and I was there, you know, I, I remember those sessions, you know? Yeah, that's amazing. Tell me about that now. As we talk about the, you, you were the first guy because obviously the rest of the older guys are like, ah, that rap stuff's a phase. That hit me, whatever, before it was up. Obviously we found out how important all those great artists were in mm-hmm. records. Was, um, was, did everybody come in when you were mastering them? Or- yeah, everybody showed up, you know, everybody showed, you know. Everybody showed up, and sometimes a little too many people would show up. There would guys be guys there, you'd run DMC. But you know, when I did all those records, they had all, all you know, every they, they, the so called posse man, they took this to another level because the studio I was working in basically, we, we would just you know, if you come in, we'd buy you lunch, you know, free lunch in the studio. So, yeah, so they bring like AR go, their friends, this other friends. It, it got a little out of hand a couple of times, but uh. You know, that's, that's, that gave me my, that gave me my start, man. I could, I could handle a room full of crazy guys and be one of them and show them the act, you know, the, you know, the action, you know, and I, at the time I had a gigantic speaker system with 25 inch subwoofers, big outtake, uh, uh, 15s, you know, ribbon tweet. I mean, I had a system that, and uh, it, you turn it up, man, the earth fucking moved and <laughs> everybody in the whole play, studio complex, Man, how he's got to turn that shit down, and but we were rocking out, man. We had so much fun. Hey, rock, hey, King of Rock, and all those rock boxes. Oh stuff. yeah, forget it. And and, and you know the, those oh, things, and they got to have the bottom. They got to have. But the, let me see, explain those recordings in those days. They were fantastic. You know, that was the day before before digital and computers. Everything was big, fat analog tape. You know, uh, qu- you know, quarter inch or half inch. You know, you know, uh, big sound. 
And you can hear it today. You put those records on against what you got coming out today. And man, there's something that there's something there that you, you, you just don't get today. Well, you get it today, but you got to pay a lot. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, it's Vintage equipment. <laughs> Even when you and I are like, where you're sitting right now, you and I are listening to things you were mastering, whether it was Vampire Weekend or Swimmers. You know, because I, you know, I, I come over a lot. We hang out, and like, um, even that's loud by your computer. But your, but your room upstairs, where, in the mastering room, was on. Yeah. I, and like I said, you are known as being the loud guy, which I well, love. I, you know, it's a vibe, and you know, look, uh, you know, I, I still to this day, I, I, my ears are perfect only because uh, I may listen loud, but it's all, um, it's all um, very tame listening. You know, it's broad spurts. It's not like. Um, I'm going to a live concert where I hear ringing or, you know, uh, it, it's a vibe thing, you know, and, 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 and I, you got to feel it, you know, this is, this is music, man, you got to feel it. If you're not feeling it, you're not getting it as for me anyway. You know, I so. agree with you. I mean, the thing is, you <laughs> have so many records that I love, <laughs> hip hop world to the rock world. <laughs> people don't know you worked with the clash on combat rock well, it was kind of it was it was a it was a whole a whole um and i got it right after they did satanista I, I worked on a little of that but that was that was a little bit that was kind of when they were they were kind of getting out of london and they ventured to new york and the, the combat rock sessions were all done at electric lady with my buddy joe blaney um and they were they were they were you know, they were in New York for a while. And this was in early 80s when New York had the graffiti. And graffiti and the future of 2000, the, um, the, all, the, all the graffiti artists were graffitiing all over. This is when New York was a cool place, I got to say. Yeah. And I agree. It, it was the best then. Or, and it was actually cool through the 90s and early, early Yeah, but the early 80s, everything was fresh and new. There were so many clubs after hours, man. You could party day and night all through the... It, it was so much fun. I, I can't even tell you how much fun it was in that day. And, and, and I was a young kid, so I, I went with the flow. <laughs> yeah, of course. And we were, I know. That's and with the artists, you know. Yeah, yeah. I love that shit when we go out all night yeah. back when we were younger. I mean, we're going from one club to another and uh, I'm absolutely mad all down Lower East. Actually, it was ever Lower East Side. But I, so yeah. tell me about your relationship working on The Clash. Did Joe Strummer or Mick Jones show up for The Master? No, Joe didn't do, but um, Mick Jones did. Joe was always a quiet guy. He left all the tech stuff to the, the tech people. Joe and, and Joe Blaney, who was actually uh, was the chief engineer on that record, showed up the sessions. And and I remember very clearly they they worked on this record for a long time. And this was a record that was one of the most anticipated. I mean, imagine in the mid eighties, eighty four. I think I'm not sure what what yeah, but it was around that time. Eighty three, eighty four. Yeah. And this was, and, right? yeah, they had had two incredible records before that, and they were they they were at the top of the game. This band was like, I mean, they were they were you know, they were they were they were the next big thing. If they weren't the big thing, they were the next biggest thing. And they yeah, they came in and did this record, and, and they they just stayed in New York, and they just did the whole New. York. That's why the, the the vibe on that record is very very like loosey goosey New York urban. And uh, you know, pretty incredible stuff, you know. Yeah, and, you know the rights, ghetto defendant. Like I me, mean, and of course, I remember when you mastered it. But I remember when Epic sent out these white label singles because I was a DJ, college radio and clubs. Yeah. Of should I stay or should I go with Rock the Castle on the back of it, like two hits, and that's and it had yeah, incredible on it. And uh, I mean, what a, what a great record, straight to hell. Well, not only that, it was great, and they recorded it all there, and and then in the end. It was mixed correctly, but then Glenn Johns, who did a lot of the Stones albums, they hired him. I don't know how, I don't know how they got to him, but he's the guy who took these incredible sessions and these great recordings that Joe did, and he mixed the record. That is a motherfucker, okay? And that's yeah. what that's what's out there today. I mean, this guy, you know, uh, you know, I, I I I take my hat off to him. He made that record. He made the sound of all those sounding uh, the the sound of that record was was that mix, but it was also. John's. taking yeah. Joe's Joe's tracks but um I there's one little known fact about that record you may not know it there was a toilet bowl commercial <laughs> and, and one I forgot what you know which one the song um you you would know Matt because you 
there was a commercial in there, and the record was coming out. It was the hottest thing on the planet. Okay, it came out. It was you know selling like like this is when CDs were you know in the hot case. The, the guy from the label calls me. and Goes, you're not going to believe this. The kid. It was a tidy bowl commercial or something, and they they put that in. This is like before samples. The guy goes, the kid, the the owner's kid from Tiny Bowl heard the song and he goes, you got to get rid of this. So they they had a cease and desist on the album. Like a minute. <laughs> and these guys, you know, you know, a record label going there selling. They're like shooting it, flying off the walls there. And some guys, oh shit! So I still remember making an edit. Sorry, just making an edit, getting to slicing that Tiny Bowl shit off there, and everybody's going. Whew, thank God. It, yeah. Yeah, it was funny. Like, I always wondered, you know, it's, it's um, it was crazy when the doors on Salt Parade at the right. end of Touch Me, they did Stronger Than Dirt. You know, yeah. the Ajax commercial? <laughs> like, kind of funny. They, I think, I guess Ajax must have thought it was cool because <laughs> they gave a shit about it. Man. But uh, that's a great story, you know. Um, you know, so, and Mick Jones, right? What a great guy Mick Jones is, you know. Fantastic, I, man. What a, what a, I mean, he was, he was a legend and he still is, you know, but he's, you know, Kind of a little bit more retired, but Mick yeah. Mick was he was the him and when Strummer was like I said he was the quiet guy, but Mick was the guy out front going to parties every night and all the he went we were I, we, I'd see him we hung out we go to the rap clubs we do he was hanging out with all the graffiti artists that's why a lot of their um a lot of those songs have a lot of the graffiti artists were doing um, cameos in it Future Two Thousand and there was a few others the big ones you know yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah, because he loved yeah. that, you know. I mean, let's be honest. When, when Bernie, when Bernie, uh, Bernie Rose, Rose. <laughs> Bernie Rose kicked Mick out. Mick, you know, Mick, Mick has said, "Hey, look, I was a bit of an asshole for a while, but they never should have kicked him out." And as soon as they did, he does like this is England. I cut the crap, but <laughs> yeah, record. I mean, it was nothing was this good because Mick was a guy who like he was the song dude. I know what you're getting at. <laughs> I mean, Joe, I mean, God, oh my God, I love those guys. So, you know. And it's cool, you know, they, they were heroes of mine. So I'm at the Capitol Theater in uh, St. New Jersey. So I'm at Palladium. But that, that, I mean, that was incredible. The night that he smashed the bass that's on the cover of uh, London Calling, because I was there. And that was fucking amazing. But, but you know what happened when they threw him out? Okay, everything went quiet for a little bit. Next thing you know, this tape shows up in my house. In, in my studio, it says Big Audio Dynamite. Who the fuck is that? You know, yeah. and then I put it on. And I nearly, I, I went, oh my god, this is, it, this is like what the fuck right. is this? And they went on a run about five records that were unbelievable. Some of the best records uh, in the in 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 the in the eighties, easily. You know that. I love all those albums. Like, remember, I worked on almost all of them. Yeah, you worked on them, right? Yeah, man. I was, and, and you know what? And it was cool because Mick. Real great lyrics like Contact and Rush and Other 99 and the Oh my record. God, great records, man. I love those records, man. But yeah, you know, like I said, like, yeah, that, that was the, the, and there's something in the water there, maybe in the booze, I don't know. But there was something in, in those days, man, people, they were just, the, these great records were just flowing like, you know, they are today too, but it, it's just different. Maybe, maybe we're getting older and, you know, I'm not. I'm not we're seeing. Older, but we're still here, Howie. We're still here. That's the best news. We're rocking. better than ever, Matt. You and I, man. You know that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, my brother. You know. So let's talk about some of the other records you did. Obviously, you've done so many iconic records. You go through your, literally go through your house, and it's like a museum for me. Oh my god! You know, cause it, any any rock, hip hop, or alternative fan would like it, it's. You know, it's beautiful. Electronic. Electronic. Let's do because we were talking about Beastie before. Let's do that next because this predated the next ones that are coming up. Tell me about doing License to Ill. Oh, that exciting. was like I can still to this day remember that session. Rick Rubin showed up. George Aculius. George, George was the um Rick's um. He's the engineer. He was great. Man, Rick's an engineer. Then the engineer showed up. Yauk, Horowitz, and 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 um. And and um, um Mike D. and and Mike all showed up at the session. I can picture this right now in the studio. And these like three punk ass kids, Rick, who's a, a little bit less, a punk ass kid, and everybody was like, "You're not going to believe this." I took the sound off for this record. I took it off. Nobody realized. So there was something called sampling, and 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 Rick was under the assumption if you buy this, you buy your album for eight bucks, you own the sound. <laughs> right, you own the album. You must own what the fuck is on there, right? And yeah. this is really what turned the whole industry 
upside down, back and forth, and, you know, because nobody really would care except the Beastie Boys license ill just came out. It was in one of the most iconic, it, it, it was probably the greatest debut album, I think, of the 80s. And not only that, but that's when the day CDs came out, sales were, they went up to four or five million sales, in, you know, just in America. I think it was almost 10 million worldwide. And could you imagine if you, you know, how many samples they stole from everybody and every, everybody yeah, came You, you did Paul's Boutique too. You did all those. So you worked on every one of those records. Check your head. Like, oh, yeah. it was unreal. I mean, if you think about that, for me. Crazy. Was, I mean, I was one of the guys, you know. I yeah, I love and rock hard. I remember when they had to pull rock hard because they sampled ACDC. Uh, yeah, pull it off the charts. I have one of the original 12. Well, you know, the BC boys were the original. They opened for Madonna for a year and for a while, you know, in her first tour, one of her first tours. And, um, yeah, but yeah, that was a great time, man. I, you know, and it was like those were the days when, you know, there was, there was excitement. And just to get back to the BCs real quick. They, you know, they got in trouble, big trouble for those samples, because then they they started the laws. So Paul's Boutique comes out, they, they they leave the label, they go to Capitol, and they decide, you know, we'll make our own samples. And that's what they did on Paul's Boutique. And that's why that you put that record on it, it is so defining of like a sound that, that I don't think to this day has ever been touched. I, I, I don't know about you, but uh, it's and very I great because you know what it was about Paul's Boutique? They could have easily just replicated their big number one album license to ill. And they were like, no, we're doing something totally different. I remember those seconds. All really? those great songs, Shadrach, all that stuff, you know? They would sample yeah, their yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. So, you know, so tell me, like, here's the interesting thing that I found about the Beasties that through working with them, and I know you probably felt the same way, they were very, very loyal. Like, that's why they kept coming back to me to do album specials. Because it was a friendship. And when Yauk was sick, um, I'll never forget that literally um, they asked uh, they asked Adam, uh, hey, listen, man, we got one more. Obviously, we're going to release this last album. Adam knew he was dying. And uh, there was, they said, hey, man. Uh, very sad. Oh, yeah, it broke my heart. And, and you know, they go, Look, is, is it cool with you if, if we do this special, album special with Matt for the last album? And he goes, yeah, man, Matt's our guy. So <laughs> they came in. So Mike P and Adam, and you know, and then I and then I run, I'm at Sirius XM, and it was after my book uh, was about to come out, or maybe it was out already. <clears throat> and I'm talking to Ad Rock, and Ad Rock's so cool. Like I said this, I think one of the other shows, he and Kathleen Hanna were like, my daughter Jessica. They were like, I remember we're at a show and like, like cool, we'll watch it, we'll hang. Like I had to do some intros. They're just, they're just the best guys ever. But I was talking to Ad Rock, and I go, I knew he was going to be writing a book, and him and Mike D. And see, I used a, a co-writer, Mitchell Cohn, amazing writer, great guy. You know, you know, you know Mitchell, because he worked at Arista in Columbia. Yeah, yeah. But I looked, I said to Adrock, I go, I go, man, I go, what, what are you about using a co-writer? He looks at me, he goes, oh man, y'all couldn't have had it. No, no. He, you know, he's like, they like, have this thing. I swear the only thing they ever did uh, without Yaku was that, that album special and then writing the book, but he, they didn't. They didn't want like any like they waited, no, no. Yeah. They waited, and that's the thing about them. I love. They were so fucking loyal, man. Well, not only they loyal, they're loyal to the people that got them there. Well, some of the you know, the, and, well, at, at some point they were loyal to that. And to me, very much, I would always get hired to do another record with them. Always hung with them. Always had fun. Um, yeah, that, that's a, that was a big thing in those days. And um, um, yeah, I mean, when, when they you know they. But they also were also loyal to the, uh, a certain a certain sound and a certain vibe and and um, yeah, it, it was it was uh, uh, it was it was that it was really they were the cornerstone of Def Jam even though you know in the end they had so many other great products on there but um, yeah which yeah. I love I mean I think that's that's amazing and, and so glad that we got to be a part of their history you especially I mean me it was like I was on the promotion. Yeah. You know, side. Well, that's why you were doing radio. Were you? Oh, you on MTV? Uh, no, I mean, I started doing radio. I did I, for a long time. I did stuff all the way through. You know, like, like on MTV, and then I did, you know, album specials. I used to do album specials with everybody. I, mean, I, I remember. So all the Seattle bands, everybody, and it. But the Beasties, it was a thing because <laughs> they, you know, it's about trust. You know, and it's like 
if people trust you and you know you're not an asshole yeah. and you, know you really love the music and care about it, they'll come back to you again. You know, and you're also the New York guy. You're like one of the hood. You're from the hood. You know, you yeah. Can hang, you know, it's to not like you were the, the record guy. You know, you were, you yeah. know, you. Were, you I was always pretty awesome. That's why we was so crazy that I ended up doing A and R and becoming VP yeah. of a, one of the VPs of A and R Artist Development at Columbia because I, you, I mean, you got you got to go out and fight for your artists, but you also have to uh, understand that you are the person that you're the liaison. You are the one who navigates through everything so you know every every side of it recording mastery but hey Howie I want to just say because you have worked on some of the most the most iconic records of my life all right so no you know what we're going to next Nirvana never mind well that was just basically um I, I forgot what year that was but that was 91, about, right? about every, you know I, I, a lot of that hip-hop stuff got a little stale for me and a lot of the other guys started moving in, mastering those records. I still had my shit share of it, but yeah, you know there was alternative and punk out. Right? But that was in in my blood. The punk and alternative is really you know stuff. I mean, I love the hip hop and the and the and the, and all the rap stuff. But the the alternative and the punk stuff, man, that's what I you know that was my blood. So it just so happened I just started. The ball was rolling on those records, you know, one after another after another. Sonic Youth, the um. Uh, all the uh, um, Dinosaur Jr., all that, um, Jay Maskus, all that stuff, you know. Yeah, you were the guy, you were the go-to guy for the All those oh, records, especially Sonic Youth, um, Jacoby Pixies. Youth. Um, you know, Pixies do little, right? I mean, you know, Pixies, like. the dude, I didn't do all, I did a whole shit ton of them. He did uh, a couple of Rosa. Oh, 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 Readers, you know. Um, Readers, you know, yeah, what, What's that? Readers, the last Flash album. I mean, yeah. your, your house, where you're standing right now, <laughs> you can come in. I know, you know what's cool? Johnny Depp was at your house and he's walking around. He's like, man, this is the fucking greatest shit I've ever seen, right? He's over there. <laughs> yeah, he, he yeah. Is, uh, yeah. It was pretty funny, too, because he was, wow, I remember, wow, holy damn. That's pretty yes, but, you know, it just, I've, I've actually, And this is the best part. I've actually collected all of this over the years. I moved around, you know, from New York here and a bunch of places in New York, but the, this is the one thing that, you know, I've always kept. Is, uh, this is this is really my pay payback, so to speak. Yeah, I love I love your house. I love the warmth there. Yeah, you know, I yeah. never got paid on one single record, by the way. <laughs> I never made a dime on one. Oh single. yeah, you know, what people need to know, it wasn't like you got a, you didn't get a point. You were mastering it. No, so, they paid the, they paid a fee and they were done. You know, and, and yeah. the studio paid me. So, but, but you know what? The great news is, Howie, because you're so amazing at what you do that you're still working. Like you know. The guy Cox Jr. album won three Grammys this year. I mean, yeah, they, yeah, 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 yeah. From the band, Broken went to number one in Alternative. You did that. I mean, I mean, it just never stops. But hey, let's talk about Nirvana. Never mind. Please. Okay. <laughs> that was, a, give, that was interesting. Give us a problem. story. I don't mind, you know, about 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 the boys and Kurt. Like, well, no, no, it was just one. Of the, I remember that record. You know, I I did a lot of work with Butch Vig, who produced the record, and and he engineered it and. Andy Wallace and mixed it. We all, it was like a family again. I worked with Butch all the time, Andy Wallace all the time, the, the Geffen Records, with Gary Kirsch all the time, and um, uh, Gold Mountain with John Silvan. I, you know, yeah, I was the guy so, who did all those records. I, love, I mean, yeah, those guys. I mean, this has been well documented by, by a lot. And the, uh, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm saying, yeah, but Howie, I want a personal anecdote about like, Hanging out with Kurt and those guys back then. Hey, they all showed up in the studio and there were all these like punk ass kids from Seattle going, We're uh we're in New York. What the fuck are we doing here? You know, it's like, you know, we, we were just we're just a punk, you know, we're an alternative punk band. We're, you know, this is you know, we're, you know, this is like big time, you know. We're, you know, we're, we're, this is not what we wanted. You know, it's just well, you know, you know, we just wanted to make a cool record that, you know, had some great songs on it and made some and some killer riffs and everything, and that's it, you know. And then all of a sudden, they're, they ended up in, in Midtown Manhattan. This fancy it wasn't fan, this fancy studio with this guy who was like, wow, you know, just running around like, yeah, yeah, you know, like, you know, dancing with these guys. And um, it was great. And I think it's been documented. But the bottom line on this one was everything showed up. All the music showed up way before the band and and the, and the producers and everything. So I, I could sit with that record all afternoon before anybody showed up. So it was just me, a big tape in the room, big monitors, and I'm going, this is pretty good. 
you know? Yeah. And in yeah. the end, by the way, the record does did almost 30 million. Can you imagine yeah. having your mitts on a, on a project that 30 million hard copies were done? Yeah. I mean, hard copies. When you, put on, when, you, when you put the tape of Smells Like Teen Spirit on, <sighs> I mean, did you feel, did you, I mean, obviously, nobody could predict a seismic shift, you know, but there was something about that, the way that was recorded. Well, I, mean, I was thinking to myself, alternative, this is not alternative, this is, this is big ass rock, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's why they hired Andy oh, Warhol. Right there in fucking South City, this is, this is not alternative. This was big rock music, big drums, big guitars, clean vocals, and the way Andy Wallace had, and he, 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 to me, I think, made that project because it, I heard some of the mixes, you know, down the line before he got him, and it was like, whoa. I mean, and he was also, and that was at the height of his career, and he was killing it. This guy was, I got to say, I mean, I work with a lot of people. This guy makes the record like nobody's business, okay? And, and that's why he's done so many. And that's why in that time and place, he made a project that was will live on forever. Yeah. Was, actually, yeah. I think it was the top 10 record of, of all that all time for them. I think it was number eight or nine. On yeah. The Rolling Stone greatest records. Yeah. It's it's good. You know? And Teen Spirit won a Grammy, by the way, too. Yeah. Well, hey, more, you know, more, more, Howie, you know, it, so I'm, I guess it's funny how I'm going down this list because. The next one is Blood Sugar Sex Magic, which changed. And I know you worked on Mother's Milk too, but it yeah. changed. It Mother's Milk, but yeah, that was another one then. Same thing, same vibe, Rick. You know, a lot of that whole posse, Brendan O'Brien, George Aculi or some. And you and I hang with Brendan. Brendan's the best. We Brendan's love him. Brendan's great. Brendan's one of the greatest engineers on our, on our planet, okay? And, um, and, you know, the bottom line is, you know, I was in New York at the time, but I heard all these stories that these guys rented a house in Laurel Canyon, which is actually right around the corner from where I am right now. Right, yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. And it was, a lot of the guys thought it was haunted. That was a, it wasn't the Houdini mansion. It was right across the street. He had, he had rented it, and I think he ended up buying it. They put a studio in there, and they just lived there, okay? And I think they were – this is after they kind of cleaned up their act a bit. And they, they, were, they were, you know, they were clear-headed, level-headed. They were clear to make a project that was, you know, to really make an uh, earth shattering record. And, and a lot of that, you know, the, the title Blood Sugar, I, I, I get was about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. <laughs> yeah, but your sex magic, I mean, it's, that album is uh, yeah. one of the greatest records ever. I mean, I love those, I love that album. I mean, you- and, you know, they, they were just, that was the first record on the first um, album on this new, on Warner Brothers and the label. Yeah. And, uh, That's off of BMI, right? So that was the deal. Yeah. And uh, and then and then you did of course Californication all that stuff but um oh, no no but Rick right Rick Rubin who produced that record was he was on that was his game right he, his game was like nothing like nobody else's again uh, you know at that time in moving he living moving from New York to L A and he, he you know he had game and that record man that had big game you know well, you know it's really interesting how guys like the Chili Peppers and even the next band we're going to talk about Soundgarden. There's, there's a period where in their songwriting career and performance, yeah. they stop being afraid to be emotional. Like, you know, like, and that's the thing, like, Under the Bridge, I Could Have Lied, Breaking the Girl. Oh, that's my God. Under the, the Bridge, Bridge was one of the greatest songs ever. And I think that was a, that was a, uh, uh, there was this whole story behind it. But go ahead. Yeah. So I'm just going to say, so now, even though for me, I want to say this because Super Unknown was, you know, the biggest Soundgarden record, and I love, I love all of them, but and I love Chris dearly, you know that. But um, but there, there was a moment. That's like the thing where Rick Rubin told Anthony Kiedis that it was all right to show the band the lyrics to Under the Bridge, like don't be like, because you know, before that they were like, we're just a party band, you know that shit. Yeah. That record was amazing how it changed everything. But obviously, when Chris did Seasons for the singles soundtrack. I remember that one. Yeah. yeah, you did. You did that too, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, right, so you go, yeah, love you. And you listen to those demos, and you hear Spoonman. I don't know. If people know that Chris had everything figured out. Like every change, he was already figured out all the tempo stuff. 
It wasn't like he brought in this thing about Spoon Man. It was like, doo, 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 doo. he was, re- he literally was so brilliant that he. Yeah, uh, he- I wreck it to this day. He's still, I think, this or Bad Motor Finger is still, yeah. they're, they're defining oh, Favorite moment. albums of all time. So, and I'm, and I'm so glad I got to work with them a lot. I want to talk about Bad Motor Finger because. Well, that was that, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. He mastered that record. That's oh, that was right after Louder. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, you're good. I'm not, I'm not gonna. We, I, we can you're, just keep cutting each other off, but uh, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna. I'm gonna defer to you, Matt, because you got on you, you, you. I love you. You know what? You and I are like this in the car. <laughs> we always hang out. How we are you driving around in LA? We're like everybody else in the car got a headache already, and, and you two of us are going. Yeah, we're cool. Yeah, we're cool. <laughs> exactly. You are so funny because good. You bring that East Coast, uh-huh. and we're like you and I just don't. It's so funny. Like, Right. I'm at the restaurant. How far away am I? 15 minutes. I'm like, you know, we were just like, we hang out all the time. We, we listen to music. Uh, Our love of music has never waned. Incredible. I love it. But yeah. anyway, so the, I, I brought that up, but I will say Bad Motor Finger was such an incredibly groundbreaking record um, for, for the band because Ben Shepard joined the band and it just yes. clicked. Like Ben joined Soundgarden and him and Matt Cameron got in a groove. And that groove worked with Kim File. It worked with Chris. And then it was like, on, man. And, you know, so talk to me about when you mastered uh, Bad Motor Finger. Because when I hear... That was a record that Sylvia Massey, you know, she's a a, a woman, produced that record. And... and, um, Or was it Terry Day? Terry Day, she mixed it. I'm sorry. She she was one that... I don't know if she would produce it. No, Terry Day... That's right. Terry Day had produced that one. And he had done Louder Than Love, the first one. And he was a Seattle guy too, so he was the local guy. And um, Bad Motor Finger, you put it on, it was like a lot of the love was a cool, loud, you know, project. But Bad Motor Finger, you put it on, and the first few songs, man, just cut your head off. How 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 unique it was, and how how passionate it was, and how and how new and fresh, you know, these guys from Seattle. Who the fuck are these guys? And and Chris's vocals were like. Nothing anybody's heard. This guy was uh, spot on. You know? Yeah, he, I mean, he's one of my favorite. Uh, obviously, Chris in, is, in yeah. my life. I was grateful to become his friend and and got close to Chris. But man, that guy was my hero even before. Like I love oh. his voice and and that record and the idea that what they were doing and you mastered that. That was one of the loudest records ever, and it was interesting because you, as you as a mastering guy, I could actually keep things kind of from clipping, but it was still. Brilliantly loud. Like I put it on my car to here. Now shine it. Go boom. Punch you in the face. Jesus Christ posed. Rusty Cage. You know what I mean? That's Terry Date. I mean, he. You know, he's. You know, he's done all the Pantera records. Terry is one of the great producers in, in, uh, of the day, and still is today. And you know, he's a Seattle guy, and and you know, he's. Um, he 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 really made that record. That was his sound, and um, and I think they parted ways in the end, but um. You know, I, th- I think with producers, you just, you run your course after a while, you know, unless you're, you know, uh, George Martin, you know, you, 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 everybody wants to go a different direction. But that direction, that was like, bam, you know, he had done the first record, which was good. And the second record, brilliant. And then that's, you know, that's how it was. Right now, it's one of my favorite records ever. So, I mean, it's like, uh, but I love all of those. Oh, records. me too. I mean, especially Rusty. Oh, man, it just put it on. And you had some Super Unknown, too, and Down on the Upside. You did them all, right? So and Great records. Fantastic. Yeah, I love them, man. You know, the nicest thing ever was I got the phone call. I mean, I stayed, I did all these radio specials with Chris. I did Euphoria Morning, all the other stuff. But I got the phone call when Soundgarden re got back together for King Animal. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, hey man, you want to do it again? And it was like 17 years later, I'm doing an album special. That fucking meant so much to me. I love it. Incredible, incredible. Oh. Hey, so all right. So another artist that we love that you've mastered fucking some of the great albums. Simon's Dream, Melancholy, Infinite Sadness. You know, like every all those records, the pumpkins. And you know what's amazing? You just worked with Billy again. Like you've been working yeah, with Billy. No, it was the same way. It was a whole happy family, Butch Fig who produced all the first two Pumpkins records. We worked together on Nirvana and all these other records. It was, it, it was that, you know, it was that era where there was a handful of guys doing these great records, you know, and, um, and, um, and I, I was there at the beginning with the Pumpkins and, and, and these were, those were, those records really changed rock and roll in, in that day. It really did. And there were hit songs really well made, great lyrics, great live band. I mean, come on. Yeah. You know, it's amazing. I was thinking about it. 
because I love Billy so much, you know, and I, I know like, you know, I love going out with Billy and hearing stories about him going yeah, out. Yeah, he's an incredible he's guy, yeah. He's the best, and like, I know you go out, you guys, you had lunch a couple times recently, you're working on new stuff, and I'm, but, and I haven't heard it yet, but I will, you know, eventually will. But I will tell you this, I love the fact that you used to be able to have a huge hit that would actually have the lyric in it, will crucify the insincere tonight. <laughs> like, 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 today you could never say that. Like, <laughs> when people were afraid to say cool things in songs. And- well, actually, a lot of kids these day, those days would only buy records that had, you know, the, the stickers, you know, explicit yeah. lyrics. Yeah, I know people me. would only buy records that had labels. And it was great. It was like, wow, I'll, I'll take that one with, with the crazy That's lyrics funny. on there. Yeah, you're so funny. I was I was just joking. <laughs> you know, he's got that line in that one song, uh, "Fuck everyone." He goes, "I got super go and protest my lyrics." Fuck that bitch. I don't need a. <laughs> <laughs> That's the greatest line ever. That's the greatest. That is funny. It is really yeah. funny. Hey, you so- know that Pumpkins Melancholy record? Just to give you a heads up, nobody had done double CDs. The, he, you know, before this one, the CDs came out maybe, and, and you know, doing a double CD and and like. Oh, you know, it was unheard of. So Billy came along and decided, he, I'm going to do a double CD. That means, you know, a four-sided vinyl. Or, and and it became one of the biggest, I think maybe to this day, one of the biggest sounding, biggest selling double CDs. I yeah, think it, it was. Like, yeah, it was. Yeah, man. You somewhere know, around in the end, 15 million, million, you know, yeah, somewhere, yeah. something close to that. Yeah. But yeah. but every every song on there was, a, I, I think, every other song on that record was a hit. It was brilliant. It was such a great record, man. And you're, you're obviously setting it up with the first album and then Siamese Dream. I love those records, man. And I just, really still, you know, he amazed me because he's still so good, man. He's still got so many, so many great songs. And he's, he's got that fire, you know, which is really, really cool to me. All right, how, we're, uh, um, you know, I thought because, you know, we talked about all, we, we kind of went through your, there are so many records that you worked on that, It'd be really funny if one day we actually do an episode where we go through your, I'll take a camera, we'll go through your, uh, <laughs> but here's the thing I said before, you are never not working. Now granted, unlike some of the other people in the industry, you don't get a point on a record. You just, you literally, when you master a record, you get a fee, yeah. but, you, but you love it. And everyone respects you for, for making, for being able to bring this deep, rich sound on a record well, thank clear you. Clear and beautiful. Clear and beautiful, which is like that's the difference. Well, but I also a clear and beautiful, but with with a vibe. Both. With, yeah, it's it, it's just like, know, with, with with it, you know, with with yeah. you know, I, and the main thing that's I try right. to get out of records are uh, I'm sorry to you know find out what the artist wants. You got to know what the artist wants, and we work we work with that. You know, and yeah. I've watched you. You know, it's funny. I've watched you master. Sat with you. And I, actually, we should probably bring this up because I haven't mentioned it. You and I were friends with Hal Wilner. We, you know, we, we I love up, Hal. Man. I loved Hal, man. We lost Hal. Hal died of a COVID nineteen. Well, we did a project together. You've heard, didn't you? He played. I was with you. I was with you in the studio and in the car with you yeah. and him. Remember? Uh, I mean, yeah, we were like you and I. I came over to your house. He was like, Hal was so cool, and and you know, Lou's Lou's best friend, like Lou Reed, and but oh, I but, think he wanted you to hear it. He he was working on this project for over three years, and I you know I, I think I said to him I said Matt Pinfield's coming he goes oh yeah I love to play it for Matt you know because he always knew that you know he could get a, he could get a real honest to goodness vibe out of you and and what and when I know when you heard it you you were like wow you jaw dropping you know yeah because T uh, Rex is so important to me like I loved Mark Poland and I uh, which is so wild because you know I, I never you know obviously. There's so it's so different because T- Mark Mark Bone and you know, T Rex and Lizzie bands like that. I'm just using it. I mean, even though they're very different, they were never really big in America. I mean, they might have one hit, right? Boys Back in Town, Jailbreak, the T Rex. It was Bang a Gong, and then you know, like on commercials, 20th Century Boy. But, but how many hits they had? It was I mean, how many great else, songs? Everywhere else, T Rex, and I loved Mark Bone, man. So that was so cool when you guys brought me into the studio. And we listened to like Bono doing Bang a Gong with you two, or it was everybody from. It was so wild. Kesha, I mean, it, it, Kesha. It, 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 Kesha. it was crazy. Ballrooms of Mars, all those great. Yeah, it, 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 it was one. This, I think, 
Now, this hasn't been released yet. The single will be out next month. But this, we all think, is going to be one of the great projects of, of 2020, easily. You know, yeah. one, one of the great records when we when the Grammys show up next year, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's amazing. You and me, it's funny how you, you, you me and Hal are hanging out. You know, Hal's like, you know, obviously he was the musical director of Saturday Night Live for like, what, 35, 40 years? But when he said, he was mad, no, no, it's not a compilation. It's a project. <laughs> It's a collection. Like he had a really definitive yeah. view. And then we're in the car, you and me and him, we're driving. And he started yeah. telling us Harry Nilsson stories. You know, like, it was cool. We're just, we're always hanging out. I love this how quite a bit. I love him, 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 man. Him, you know, I love, uh, you know, I mean, uh, you know, my old sponsor, um, Neil Asher. Like, I just, uh, it's crazy times. But here's the great thing. What we're doing right now is we're bringing our love and our positive energy for music well, that's what I'm trying to say. Even in the, these crazy times of ours, we we know we know how to do it. We we know how to get things done. We know how to work. You know, work with adversity. We know how to take something uh, negative and make it positive. You know, and that's that, that's really what for me what it's all about right now. And and the stay home thing. I mean, I have a nice house here, and I, you do too. And you know, we're, we're 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 doing something different again. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and. No, I was go ahead. I, I was, I was gonna say, so shout out to all these guys making records at home. Man, it, it's this this year is you're gonna see you're gonna see music and you're gonna you, nobody's even heard yet that's been done in these bedrooms in these houses like the Billy Idol stuff was done last year. It's gonna even surpass that. And the technology is there. You know, I work with a company Lander who they do all this algorithm technology. We you know we have. You know, we, you know, basically, it's 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 all remote. Everything is worked. You know, you do a record, and everything is remote. And look at Lander. We're, we're getting, you got involved with Lander, and and you're working with them. I thought that was so cool what you guys are doing. You know, what well, I mean? the technology thing is so, so moving so fast, and and it's it's more like more about um, 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 algorithm stuff. You know. It, you know, uh, artificial intelligence is really, it's going to, in the next few years, because we're all going to be, now we're going to be at home a lot, and we're going to we're gonna be introverted a bit. The artificial intelligence is, is hasn't even scratched the surface. So, and big things are coming on that end. I can't, you know, I can't really say yet, but, um, you know, especially in the recording and mastering business, it's crazy. What we, what we can do out of our laptop and our desktop is unbelievable. And, yeah. um, and it's it's, it's it. great seeing you on these shows. Go ahead, man. I just said I watched you do it, man. And you're not sitting there like it's right. Vampire Weekend record or it's uh, Gary Clark Jr., which you, you know. Well, I figured out I've done almost 10,000 records. 10,000, okay? I have almost 19,000. I, I, I can show you. I got, it, I, got it, I got I got the numbers on my computer. And wow, 27 like billion streams. And I don't even know what 27 billion is. I think. I think that's what um didn't that what Shake Shack got this year? Yeah. Uh, you and I have stopped with Shake Shack late. <laughs> you know, like, didn't, oh, didn't, that was a funny story. Right yeah. Oh shit, we got it. we better give it back. They they're gonna find out we don't need it. <laughs> but anyway, this I mean, go ahead. No, I was gonna say how it's amazing. I mean, I gotta tell you how great it is. I mean, I, I love you as a friend. You we hang out. I, I miss actually us being going everywhere because we you and i are always Man. going everywhere you know yeah. you, our crew you know our crew you know and joey's on tomorrow joey santiago from the pixies yeah. we're all three of us you can see it look you see, we, yeah. see look know? come on who's yeah we, look, hey uh, and my, uh, my, you you're myself, you're <laughs> me. Huh? You're great and i want to tell you that and mark foster who we love very much and he was Mark's on a great guy we're all, we all hang together we're like the boys you know we all we have dinners together we're just you know yeah. This, this you know, is a great thing. It is. So, you know, I, I, I can't wait till we can actually be together again. But in the meantime, thank God for technology because we can stay in touch this way. Well, we right? just want to entertain people. And and here, here's the thing. And, and, you know, we know so many musicians. And right now, since all the studio, the big studio, everybody's doing a record at home. And all I can say is, I mean, I can't wait for the next this year to come out. You can hear music you've never heard before. Yeah, you, know, and you, you had. I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna end our interview by saying, <laughs> you literally, I think had like seven number one records last year, maybe more <laughs> that you worked on. Great. And yeah. 
you know, and uh, I just want to tell you, but listen, thanks for taking the time today, brother. Oh, you know I what? Can... At any time you call me and I just get on my computer, man, and and we're, we're, let's hang. Let's 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 cavell, let's kvetch, let's you know, we're, yeah. you know, we'll hang. We'll get a couple of slices, you know, and we'll yeah, dude, yeah, you know, miss, <laughs> you, me and Zoli. You want to know Zoli? Get a couple of Joe's pizza, you know, and uh, yeah, you got Joe's because it was it's a close <laughs> to, uh, New York pizza slice, New York slice, and all that yeah. stuff, man. Yeah. But it's great, man. Yeah, man. Yeah. man. I love you, Howie. Thank you. We got guys. We should thank everybody involved, and we are here. Five o'clock. First of all, I need to let everyone know that Carrie Brown, Linda Perry. Oh, they're the best. I, they, they're my bros and yeah. broettes. Aren't they amazing? <laughs> yeah, and and Aaron and Stephen and Nate and Andre from Proper Platforms, all the people that have been involved in making this show happen. So well, how uh, great is this? I mean, this came. All this stuff came out of nothing, you know. I yeah. mean, this never existed, you know. I mean, it existed, but not like it is now, where, where you, you know, where your computer now and your 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 house is really your sanctuary. I mean, it was before, but now it's really, you know. Yeah, it's that, you know, and that's where create creativity happens. You know? Yeah, I mean, I, and of course, more than ever, we need that outlet because it's. it's I mean, how you always worked out of your house, but we would go out everywhere, so you had that. Oh yeah, I'm a people person. I got to be honest with you. I am a people person. Yeah, you and are. So this really, I, I you know, I got antsy. <laughs> it's hard. Let me tell you, Dave. How there's that day that you and I rode our bicycles yeah. in Santa Monica, like seven towns down. You and I rode bicycles yeah. for four <laughs> hours, man. That was the greatest feeling in the world. The freedom yeah. of riding by the beach. You and me riding. Well, I miss oh, it's still doing right now. We're doing it in a mess, but it, 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 it's that you know, it's that camaraderie and uh, yeah. camaraderie, and I think it's back. It's going to be back soon. It, it, it's this is just a, a how they call it a blip a bump on the road. Uh, okay, yeah, a bump on the road. Okay, so to speak. You know, well, Woo, okay, we're back. Yeah. How you, I love you, and we got. I know they have another show coming up, but thanks for taking the time. You know, uh, and, and you were great today. And the story. How many how many things you were involved with that are historic? And, and, and easily reachable. Easy to music history. It just for me, it means the world to me. And I'm sure everyone watching, and and of course, our friendship is one of the most important things too, because we're brothers. So anyway, <laughs> I'm gonna let everybody know tomorrow. One of our other guys we hang out with all the time, Joey Santiago from the Pixies, will be here. Joey's and a man. I remember that Joey and one of the great right. guitar players of our day, easily one of the one of the most unique guitar players. Put it that Joey way. Joey inspired the loud, you know, like obviously him and Frank Wright, but he, you know did it together in the Pixies. But it was Joey with a like that, you know, that inspired everything from like smells like. I can't wait to, to watch. So yeah, you know, great tomorrow. You know, so. All right. Anyway, I got a session. I got to go. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, brother. And thanks for being here. It's called In a Lonely Place. My name is Matt Pinfield. Howie Weinberg. Howie Weinberg for spending the time with us today. We got an incredible week planned. Tomorrow, Joey Santiago of the Pixies will be our guest. And then after that, the next day, Brian Vander Ark from the Verb Pipe, who's a dear friend of mine. I, I mean, we got stories. It will tell you about us traveling around Michigan. It's really cool stuff. Aaron Bruno, A1 Nation, will be here on Thursday. And a guy who I think is one of the most exciting, incredible young artists out there right now who I love, uh, who I was lucky enough to become friends with. And I called him up and said, hey, let's do the show. It's Youngblood. Yeah, I love him. So it's going to be an incredible week. And then wait till you hear who we have for the next couple of weeks. This show is taking on a life of its own. I'm very, very grateful because I work with great people. And Rick Krim. We need to give Rick Krim a lot of love because besides being one of my best friends, he's been also involved in the booking. Renee Mata, all the guys that are involved. So I'm going to let it go, but hey, Howie, thanks for doing this. Love you, brother. Peace Pitt out, bro. Got it. In a lonely place, Matt Pitt. <laughs> Keep the music in your heart. We'll see you tomorrow.